Hello and welcome to Mountain Connect 2020 virtual conference. Thank you for joining us for the community development track. And today we're going to be discussing how a municipal fiber to the home network helps its community thrive. My name is Kip Tibbetts and I'm the regional sales manager for Momentum Telecom. Uh, so even before COVID, uh, there was an ever growing need for rural broadband. Now it's more important than it ever was before. So we're going to be discussing how a municipal fiber network helps both residential and commercial growth for cities during normal times, how they've helped during COVID, and how to make sure you're finding the right partners along the way to help you achieve your goals. I have three wonderful guests with me today, and all of them have either deployed their own municipal fiber network or have helped other communities via public-private partnership. I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves and give you a little background about themselves and the companies which they represent. So, uh, Christy, if you don't mind, I'll start with you. Hey, thank you. Well, I'm Christy Batts. I'm the Broadband Division Director for CD Light Van in Clarksville, Tennessee. We've been in the broadband um, business since 2007. We're the munis municipal electric provider in the market. Um, we have about just over 24,000 um, customers um, on the broadband side of the business, about a 32% penetration in the market. Uh, for Clarksville and are home to the 101st Airborne Division and Austin P State University, let's go P. And um, I spent uh, 13 years prior to coming to um, CDE as a marketing director for a um, large corporate cable company. And then in between that and starting with CDE Light Band, um, I was our executive director for our local chamber of commerce for five years. So Clarksville native um, and super excited to be part of this uh, panel today with, and, and share what we've done here in Clarksville with our municipal broadband. Oh, good deal. Thank you, Christy. Uh, Coleman? Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Coleman Keene. I'm the broadband, uh, executive broadband director for the city of Fort Collins. I'm a CPA by trade, a technologist at heart. Uh, I've been working in the broadband arena since uh, early 2000s. Uh, I really started that journey working for EPB in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I've worked with several municipals, co-ops, uh, investor-owned utilities on their smart grid or smart city or fiber to the home initiatives. And now I'm here in uh, beautiful Fort Collins. Uh, glad to be a part of this. Uh, thank you, Coleman. And Zachary? Hi, uh, my name is Zachary Maggot. I'm the engineering manager here at Matrix Design Group and uh, Matrix Connected Fiber. In that role, I've worked to develop our company's broadband portfolio in the New England area uh, with a, a direct focus on the rural community fiber of the home projects. Our expertise in fiber optic networks began a little over 25 years ago, starting with a, a 10 town fiber of the home build. Um, we're currently in the process of building seven more systems uh, to bring internet access to community members. Uh, we provide regions and communities uh, with the fiber of the home communication systems capable of handling their big data um, and our customers they can get fast reliable network infrastructure capable of growing with their business operations and ever-changing connection needs good deal uh thank you all again for joining us today and for sharing some of your expertise as we move forward so uh christy i want to lead off with you uh, when you and I spoke previously, you had told me about how your city, Clarksville, Tennessee, is a collegiate and a military town. Uh, the city has always embraced these two segments of the population. However, you saw an opportunity in creating a fiber to the home network as a way to further support the students, the military members, and their families. Uh, since the creation of CDE Light Band, uh, you mentioned to me that there has been more of a movement for people to remain in the city uh, long term, buying homes instead of renting, for example. And it has also led to more job creation. Uh, could you please give us a little bit of more background on this and how CDE's network has helped Clarksville grow both residentially and commercially? Sure, I'd be happy to. You know, years ago, um, and we really saw this as part of when I was in the um, cable industry side of the business, um, when we had our first deployment with the first Gulf War, um, it was really devastating for this community because when the soldiers left and were deployed, um, many of the family members packed up and left the community. They didn't feel that sense of, of um, the need to stay in the community. It really um, hurt our community overall and had lots of businesses closed, um, housing 
um, pretty much stalled um, new housing, house building and that sort of thing. And it was really, really devastating for our market. The community as a whole decided we need to take a step back and take a look at how we incorporate our military and their families into our community, have a little bit stronger relationship with them and, and build um, a community that they're willing to stay in and, and hopefully even retire in. So as a community, we began developing programs and, and processes. We really made pushes for businesses to be willing to hire military spouses or exiting military into their business. We've set pl put plenty of programs together in the community to, to build that cohesiveness. And then we also directed our focus over to our university. We have bright, talented young people who were from our community, attended a, a, a you know, a fully accredited university in our community. And then the moment they graduated, they left town and took their talent and their knowledge somewhere else. So we really began cultivating what we could do in our community to change the shift. Fast forward to um, September 11th um, and all of the, the changes that our, our world went through at that point, our military here has been on multiple deployments through this entire Gulf presence that we've had after September 11th. But our family members stay, our retail sector still perform very well, our housing is, is, is growing astronomically in this market. And we have become really very close to being recession proof. So where other communities are faltering in tough economic times, our communities continue to build houses, open new restaurants, open new retail locations, um, drive a new uh, economic development focuses with new um, industries in the market, and we've continued to grow. Um, the broadband piece of that has been very, very important in that for a couple of reasons. One, we're now seeing the trend with housing development and even potentially with um, apartment rentals in the market where folks are asking one of the first questions is, do you have access to CD light band? in this house or in this apartment um, before they'll actually agree to purchase and or buy or rent the, the property. So we're seeing a trend with that, but also what we're seeing is the growth and development of our small business. We have a lot of exiting military that are retiring and they're staying in the market. They're opening up small businesses, microbreweries, um, mom and pop shops type things, retail outlets, that sort of thing. And our um, internet services and our and the services we provide have become very important to them for that because a lot of times what they've started with is online businesses and then have been able to grow into um, storefront type shops. So we're excited to be able to be a part of that as well. Wow, good stuff. Um, thank you very much. Now, uh, Zachary, I want to keep on the same train of thought with you. Um, at Matrix Design Group, you guys serve as an expert to help rural operators uh, get their projects off the ground. Uh, you had had some interesting uh, stats around residential and commercial growth, as well as um, fiber networks having a positive effect on property values and GDP. Uh, could you expand on that a little bit for us, please? Sure, of course. So from a residential perspective, we've seen that the fiber networks have helped retain and even grow the populations in these small rural towns. Most recently, we've seen an increase in local building permits go from about 1.5% of the structures being permitted on a yearly basis up to about 7%. And that's just during the course of the network build out phase. So new homes are going in, new young families are staying in the community. Um, and to Christie's point, it also allows for a lot of online scalable type businesses to, to come into the areas. The main incentive for a lot of these improvements have been uh, revolving around that positive effect on the home and property values. Uh, in, in the markets that we serve, we've seen an increase of, of, of around 3% for, and um, in some of the communities that, that can net the owner and increase a value between 5,000 and 15,000 in added property value. Uh, and that's being created just from the new capabilities being brought into these communities for them to access uh, the internet as a whole and all of the, the ancillary and peripherals that, that come with that. Good deal. Thank you very much. Uh, Coleman, do you have anything you'd like to add to that piece? Sure. I, I think that, you know, kind of going back to what Christy was talking about at Chattanooga, you know, starting in the 80s, you know, we started to see the brain drain where our young folks were going off to college and not coming back to Chattanooga. 
Chattanooga was an industrial town, and when the industry moved offshore, uh, you know, Chattanooga was really hurting. And, you know, um, it wasn't just based on the broadband, but it was a citywide initiative to basically rebrand and, and change how the city was viewed and the opportunities that were available. Uh, within three years of launching broadband, you know, we had a very vibrant downtown. We had, you know, young kids moving to Chattanooga without a job saying, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to get here. I'm going to get into this gig economy and, you know, make it work. And so there was a huge change for Chattanooga. Um, I, I also agree with Zachary when you look at opportunity. As communities are looking at broadband, they really need to spend some time investing and thinking about what's the big why. Why am I doing this? Is it you know, education? Is it digital equity? Is it you know, uh, for future growth? Uh, is it to future proof your city? So for many communities today, broadband is equivalent to electricity or to the freeways or the railroads. If you were bypassed by a freeway or a railroad back in the 1800s or the, the mid 1900s, um, your city was really sucking wind. And so, you know, from a Fort Collins perspective, we think that communities should have the right of self determination, but they should really understand why they're doing this and what they're trying to accomplish. Good deal. Uh, Coleman, I want to stick with you for the next question as well, if I may. Um, when Fort Collins was first starting their project, uh, it's my understanding that the incumbent carriers really weren't paying much attention. However, once you guys became more serious and more real in their view, they began displaying some bad behaviors to try to hinder your progress. Could you explain some of the hurdles that you guys faced and how a grassroots campaign with your community kind of helped get this thing going for you? Sure. Like many communities, our uh, broadband journey started long before we actually got to put a shovel in the ground. And we're back to the Google Fiber days and that kind of stuff. And, you know, when, um, when Fort Collins first started looking at what uh, to future proof the city, that was really a big driver for Fort Collins. They sat down with the incumbents and said, what are you going to do for the city to make sure that we're a viable community well into the future? And basically, the incumbents didn't have an answer, uh, basically said nothing. And so uh, that was where we started with the incumbents. And they kind of, like you said, they kind of just kind of you know, stood aside for a while. When it came time to do our final votes to move forward, uh, they basically spent a million dollars on ads to fight our Fort Collins deployment. Uh, we had a local grassroots group that basically was able to pull together about $15,000, maybe $18,000 to fight that. There was a lot of um, grassroots you know, activity going on that helped. So uh, a group you know, was formed called Broadbands and Beers. It was local people that got together and, you know, had experts come in and talk to them and educate the public about what broadband is and what the city of Fort Collins was trying to do. So there was a huge groundswell from the community uh, to fight what the incumbents were doing. And um, there are several famous YouTube videos out there. Uh, one of the ones I really like uh, was they we're basically saying that Fort Collins should be investing this money in roads and not in fiber. And so they were showing a traffic dam in Fort Collins, which was about four cars. Um, you know, and on the YouTube video, the guy was, and this was a community going, that is not a traffic jam, just so you know. Um, and so there was that kind of stuff that they did. Uh, it was unsuccessful. We got a, an overwhelming majority of people who voted for Fort Collins to move forward. Good deal. I'm glad you guys did as well. Um, now, uh, Christy or Zachary, do either one of you want to add on to this? Of course. So to uh, Coleman's point is, as service providers look to deploy broadband infrastructure in cities and towns across the country, access to the utility poles and other infrastructure sites is going to remain an issue. In many cases, the incumbent uh, service or utility provider who owns the poles, they, they have that level of organization and local logistics planning that's totally separate from uh, the typical process. And the, the end result ends up being just a, a massive delay and a, and a cost burden um, that has to be burdened by the, the uh, company who's looking to get their assets up on the pole. And the inefficiencies uh, of those separate truck rolls um, end up with lengthy timelines and, and really ultimately just punish the underserved communities uh, with that reduced effectiveness, the effectiveness of how far their dollar can go, how many subscribers they can actually light, or what their final uh, subscriber passing cost ends up being. Um, so I think to uh, Coleman's point, you can you, 
you you must try to work as, as well as you can, but sometimes you do need the, those grassroots campaigns to um, really put the utilities back in their place to help benefit these communities and future-proof these areas. Christy, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I, I you know back to what, both what Zachary and Coleman said. You know, it's a challenge in, in a market when you're you're going up against incumbent. Um, and and what they they want to the roadblocks they want to put into place. We've had everything from um, very um, direct um, uh, addressing our shortcomings and the things that we couldn't provide from our incumbents to um, door to door salespeople who told um, potential customers from for the incumbent that they didn't need to go with our service because we were just buying our bandwidth from them anyway and it was the same service so we've we've dealt with all of those challenges as well we didn't have as much on the infrastructure side because of course we owned the poles and and it made it a little bit more uh, easy for us to, to manage that process as well. But uh, definitely the incumbents um, certainly um, uh, get very engaged in the market. Um, we even had them attending our, our public board meetings uh, because I was required to share what our, our, our pricing and our, our sales goals and our plans were all the way down to marketing plans in a public board in public board meetings initially, and they would attend those. So they knew everything we were doing and what we were going to price for before we even got started. Um, so it was, a, it was a real challenge. Well, good deal. Thank you guys for um, that information on that, those pieces there. I'm sure that's going to help out a lot of people because that's something they're definitely going to be encountering themselves as they try to move forward. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit because I think we would all be remiss if we didn't uh, address how COVID has affected our communities. Uh, with everything that's been going on over the past several months, uh, the need for rural broadband has been amplified to the nth degree. Um, and speaking with each of you, I've learned some ways that you guys have worked with your communities. Um, I'd like to, for each of you to kind of give a brief example of how your organization has done to try to help your communities during these times. Uh, Christy, I want to start with you again. Uh, could you let us know a little bit how CDE worked with the local uh, schools and universities to help the students during this time? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's been a real challenge. Um, this year, um, in particular with the start of the school year this fall, about 60% of our students opted for a traditional classroom method, while about 40% of those decided to um, do a virtual um, uh, learning process. Um, it presented some serious um problems for our school system. They really did a lot of hard work and planning trying to prepare for that uh, <clears throat> for the students in both environments. But, but by day three of the, of the uh, school system's um, start of the school year, I was receiving a call from their IT director um, and they had a 10 gig connection with us to deliver all their bandwidth and they were bumping up on eight gig and he was extremely nervous about whether they could maintain um, what they needed to for the students as they really got more engaged and and everyone started connecting remotely with the, with the teachers in the classrooms um, we were able to work with him and his staff and by that afternoon had increased their bandwidth to 20 gig so that they could actually um, respond um, 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 and, and provide the, the, the resources the students need. Um, we suspect, um, based on conversations um, that we've had with them, um, that if we continue to have cases rise in our community, and right now we have it, it, at least one school that is doing everything virtually for the rest of this week in, in order for them to be able to uh, manage the large number of teachers that have had to leave um, with, with COVID. Um, that we suspect that, um, if that continues, they may go 100% virtual and they're already talking with us about a 40 gig connection. And we're, we're prepping and, and putting all the things in place to be able to, to supply that with them. So I think our biggest support of them was having a network that was built in such a way that it gave us that scalability and that flexibility to be and, and the ability to respond quickly. Um, to the needs of, of our, our um, uh, students and our school system. Additionally, we were approached by the Housing and Urban Development Group. There were a lot of students in low-income areas that did not have access to um, internet services. 
Um, the school system was supplementing as much as they could with hot spots, but there was a concern from the from the um, HUD folks that they would not be able to, to accommodate every student. We went out and they wanted us to build a, a Wi-Fi network in each of the properties to, to allow the students to have access within their homes. Unfortunately, most of those places are built uh, with a concrete block building with a brick face. So penetrating that with a Wi-Fi network was, was near impossible. So we got creative with them and we identified some community centers um, and it solved two problems really for the HUD group. Um, some of these students, the school system requires the students to have what they call a learning monitor or an adult nearby that makes sure that the student's able to log in, is doing the assignments the way they should do. And some of these um, students in the low income um, areas didn't have a parent that could be there. Um, during the school day because they were working or, or had other other things going on. And so um, by putting up a Wi-Fi network in the community center, the HUD groups were able to assign a staff member to each of those community groups that also served as a learning monitor. And those students now have the flexibility to go into those community centers and do their classwork, get the help and support that they need. And, and we were able to get that turned around within a matter of about a week week and, and allow them to be able to respond to help those students as well. Good stuff. Um, Coleman, um, I'll go to you next. Uh, could you talk a little bit how Fort Collins uh, helped the local school districts and how your uh, vendor partners kind of help facilitate this for you? We lost audio on for you there, Coleman. Uh, it, it was an interesting journey. Uh, we actually started engaging that in late March. I had uh, Juliana, who uh, takes care of our NDU and business sales, came to me and said, you know, there were several mobile home parks where there was absolutely no connectivity for the students to be able to go online and do their schoolwork. And so um, I met with her and several of our staff and started looking at, you know, what could we do to help out? Uh, and then the same day, the, the, the city manager had just met with our Poudre School District, uh, the head of our Poudre School District, and she was telling them their problems. And he came to me and said, is there anything we can do? And so uh, when we got involved, what we found out there were four mobile home parks that had a high number of low income students and there was absolutely no connectivity. They were private property um, you know, type thing. And what they have is basically DSL. And uh, the Poudre School District had put up a, uh, a hotspot, a Wi-Fi or a Verizon hotspot that was attached to a Wi-Fi uh, AP, you know, at the, at the clubhouse basically. So they were getting less than 10 meg for all of the students inside of those mobile home parks and the students had to drive or walk to the clubhouse to get there. So uh, when we started looking into it, we found out that um, most of these actually were not inside of our city footprint. They were outside of our footprint they were literally right across the street. So uh, our first thing that we did was we tried to get fiber connectivity to replace the MiFi hotspot. And so in a very short period of time, uh, we were able to pull together uh, city fiber, county fiber, connection fiber, uh, a, a utilities fiber and patch together networks that literally could get connection to that hotspot. And then we replaced the hotspot with a much beefier Wi-Fi solution. For two of them, we couldn't get fiber there, so we did a real quick proof of concepts and developed a point-to-point -point wireless solution to get them coverage. In some one case, we were shooting across the river. Another one, we were shooting through a tree-lined street for about a half mile. So we were able to get that, those solutions up and running in about six weeks, and we went from 10 megs or less to basically 400 megs to a gig available for those students. At that point in time, you know, I was very upfront. I said, these are very temporary. We'll be lucky, you know, if they last, you know, a couple months, the way they were designed. And I, you know, I told my staff, you know, we want to make sure that we get that's good enough to last till August. At that point in time, I was figuring summer school was going to be an issue also. And so uh, we did that and that was very successful, but it didn't solve the school year problem. And so as soon as we got to that May timeframe, we started engaging with the Poudre School District on what's next. So we think that the COVID thing is gonna go on and how do we deal with the next school year? And um, at that point in time, CARES money was starting to get, get to be available. And so we started a pretty significant effort to look at building a private LTE network 
for these private properties that these students live in. And we had identified 11 or 12 properties. And so we engaged with uh, Nokia and Cisco and some of our other prime vendors uh, to basically design a CBRS uh, private LTE network. And we were very successful. We had a very robust plan. The Poudre School District at the last second decided to go with uh, MiFi hotspots that they bought for the kids. Um, you know, so they got very focused on um, a one-year solution where we were trying to give them a three-year solution because, you know, we were worried that COVID is going to go a little bit longer than people expect. Uh, so uh, our vendors came together, came up with a great solution. Uh, the Poudre School District came up with something that'll work for a short period of time. And so everybody kind of won uh, on that one. Uh, just that, uh, you know, staff learned a lot, got a lot of good cross-functional work together in governmental entities. So there's a lot of good relationships there that will pay off in the future. Good deal. Uh, Zachary, you had some interesting insight on how all of this uh, affects not only the students, but also teleworkers. Uh, could you uh, please go into a couple of examples of the positive effects that have been created in communities by having a fiber network? Sure, of course. And I, I feel like we have a, a particularly interesting perspective, both as a, a rural ISP company, but also as a, um, a an engineering firm actively doing work. So we can speak both to what some of the uh, customers of our networks have been experiencing that are business owners, but also what we've been experiencing uh, with the telework environment. Um, and it, it's certainly apparent now that the telework environment is a benefit to the, the worker, the family, and also the company. Um, it's hard to ignore the, the growing traffic crisis um, <clears throat> in the country, but getting some of the vehicles off the road and some time back to the workers and the families is, is definitely a benefit um, for, for everybody. And uh, in the rural areas that, that we particularly uh, target up in the New England area. Um, to Coleman's point, it's DSL or nothing. And in a lot of these communities, if you move or you cancel or turn off your phone service, you can never get it again. So even during the sale of a home, uh, once that home sells, they will never come back to reconnect you. If you have an issue, if it's a windy day, if it's a rainy day, that service can definitely be interrupted. So what we've seen up there is um, even with the, the storms and the microbursts and hurricanes that the, these areas experience um, up in the mountains is that the, the workers are still able to be productive um, if, during a weather event. They don't have to uh, endanger themselves by being on the roads in a, in a uh, violent storm or anything or in the congestion. Um, and, and another benefit that we're, we're really seeing um, start to pop up now that there's been a, a significant duration of time where everybody has now settled in and become more productive at home and used to that remote working environment is really the carbon footprint. Now that um, the focus on COVID is now in mitigation um, and adjustment to, to all of our personal lives and business lives, um, people are getting back to the things that um, were important before the crisis happened. And, and one of those really comes down to the environment, um, not having the, the vehicles on the road, having um, all the disposable products in the office environment, at the coffee machine, et cetera, um, have, have really been uh, one of those key items that, that people are happy to be a part of um, and passively. And it, it seems to be benefiting everybody from the office not using the electricity um, and, and heating and cooling the space. And then also something that most people don't think about, and that's the, the data center space. So as an engineering company, we're also seeing a huge bump um, in the needs of the data center capacities to service all of the increased backhaul from the uh, endpoint user. Um, so centralizing all of that heating, cooling, control, electricity, management, et cetera, to those isolated data center spaces, um, it creates a more robust environment, but it also uh, keeps the costs down there. Um, so we're, we're happy to be part of that, that green push again. Good deal. Thank you. Um, all right, I, I would really, I want to kind of wrap this up by giving each of you a, a moment to provide some words of wisdom to anyone out there who's looking to create their own fiber to the home network. Um, what advice can you give to anyone about choosing the correct partners to achieve their goals and any potential hurdles that they may encounter along the way during their build outs? Uh, I want to go in reverse order from the beginning this time. So uh, Zachary, I'll start with you. Sure. Thank you. So 
my favorite advice to, to give uh, communities, regions, et cetera, who are looking to pursue their, uh, their, their goals here is pursue your goals, pursue your objectives, gather as much help from local, state, federal government resources, incumbent resources, um, and the, the viability of your community need not be burdened on this solely on the shoulders of your organization, um, MLP or, or broadband committees. Um, look to other people in your region uh, engage with your private provider and and help somebody walk with you to to uh, begin this journey. Good deal, uh, Coleman. Yeah, so um, uh, there are several things that I kind of go through with uh, with municipalities that are interested or communities that are interested in doing this. Uh, the first is if you have a utility, you're more than halfway there. You already have plant that under, uh, people that understand outside plant. You have a customer service infrastructure. Uh, but having said that, the next one is a biggie, and that's understanding culture. You know, you're taking a startup organization and putting it into an existing culture, and a lot of times there are conflicts, decision-making, and that type of stuff that you need to think about. And then the next one, this kind of goes back to something that Christy had mentioned earlier, is governance. So how are you going to operate a competitive business in a government environment? So you have open records issues, you have open meeting issues, and stuff like that. You need to put a lot of thought in, into that. Um, you know, and then, you know, what I say is um, you also have to be thinking about, uh, you know, your, your big whys. Why are you trying to accomplish this? How are you going to measure success? And make sure that your staff is investing time throughout the entire process to learn all of these things and also to understand, um, you know, with your selection of partners that you have a good fit. Your partners can make or break you. And so when we do our RFPs and we're doing an evaluation, we bring non-technical people in to also evaluate the cultural fit for the company. Uh, and I think that's really important. So uh, making sure that you have a good working relationship with any vendors that you choose is critical. Good deal, thank you. And Christy. Yes, I, you know, I'm gonna, um, you know, reiterate a lot of things that Zachary and Coleman both shared, but I think the single most important thing that I could tell anyone is, you know, if if you want to go down this path, um, have a plan and then stick to your plan. Um, you know, make sure that what your plan, what you what you set out to do is something that you can actually accomplish and then and build that business plan and stick to it. Um, find those community advocates, um, finding those folks in the market that will support what you're doing, whether it's government officials, business leaders, that sort of thing. Those are the folks that will carry your message beyond just what you want to share in the market. And then um, talk to others that have done this. Um, go, go to the communities that are the same size as yours, but then go to the bigger communities. Everyone has been through something. Everyone's failed at something, been hugely successful at something, made the wrong choices initially. Talk to those people. And then when you find those right partners, use them um, to, to your benefit. That's what they're there for. They're a resource for you. And, and when you find that right fit, as Coleman said, uh, make sure you utilize them. Make sure if they give you advice that you actually follow it and, 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 um, and, and manage your, your business as a partnership with them. Because as you grow, they'll grow as well. And, and Kip, I'd like to add just more, one more thing. What Christy said is spot on. Uh, when you're going and visiting other communities, you need to go visit communities that struggle also. Don't just try to find the successes, right? There's a lot to be learned from other people's past mistakes, and it's invaluable information. Um, and this kind of gets back to what I was talking about, making staff, make sure your staff is engaged through this process so that you have that knowledge and understanding as you move this project forward. Good deal. Thank you. Um, well, that's going to do it uh, for this community development panel, everyone. Uh, I want to thank, again, thank my guests for joining us today, uh, taking time out of their busy schedules and sharing some of their expertise with us. Also want to thank all you folks who are joining virtually with us today. I uh, hope this was very informative for you. Please feel free to reach out to me with any questions you may have for me or my panel members. And I look forward to seeing everyone next year in person for Mountain Connect 2021. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.